My first wife had passed. She passed away in October of 1999, and I had uh, one day after, two days after burying her to go back to work. My job said, we want you in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which was about a 400-mile, 350-mile drive from where I was in Chester, Pennsylvania, and I remember driving up the turnpike and hearing playing this song I just kept playing this CD over and over again the healing song my heart was heavy my heart was heavy and um, I played this all the way from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh Pennsylvania but when I got up around Harrisburg uh, just outside of where Karen uh, Herzog lives I was up in the Harrisburg area and I must have been zooming up and down the highway. I mean, tears running down my face, and I had to go to work. I had to drive all across to the other end of the state, and um, I didn't realize the, the speedometer was up around 85, 90 miles per hour. I had no clue. I was just driving. You know, God can use a policeman to be an angel. God can send an angel in the form of a policeman. Uh, a state policeman uh, pulled me over. I saw him when he clocked me, and he pulled me over, and, and uh, I, wound, I wound my window down. He just stood there. He said, hey, what's going on? And I was crying. I had tears running down my face. He said, what's going on, man? He said, you know you're speeding? I said, yes, yes. He said, what's going on? I told him, I said, I just buried my wife two days ago, and I've got to go to work in Pittsburgh. So I'm driving to Pittsburgh. He said, hey, brother. He said, unless you slow down, you will not get to Pittsburgh. He said, so slow down, take your time, pull over the rest stop and rest for a little while, and then you start up your journey. He said, I know it's hard on you. He said, but you take your time and you drive carefully. You know, ladies and gentlemen, God sent an angel, was an angel in the form of a policeman to slow me down, which meant God had plans for me. I was playing this song that we play so often, the healing song by Richard Smallwood. And um, that policeman comforted me, gave me a word of caution. He didn't write a ticket. He said, I'm not going to ticket you. I won't even write a word of warning. He said, he said, I won't even write a warning citation. I just want you to slow down so you can make it to Pittsburgh. And from that point on, I slowed down and uh, stopped at several rest stops on the way, and I made it to my assignment. My heart goes out to Dr. Jean Bratton today, who uh, got news today that her sister passed away, her older sister, Julie. Our hearts grieve with you. And for all the people out there who have lost loved ones, many through uh, the coronavirus, many through other means, our hearts go out for you. But I want, I want to let you know, just as my heart is heavy, as I even reflect back 20, over 20 years ago, uh, it's still just as vivid. I reflect back uh, when I buried my first wife and um, going to Pittsburgh, having to go to work, not wanting to, not feeling it, feeling aching in my soul. There was emptiness and agony in my soul, my spirit, and a policeman came out of the blue and said, I want you to slow down, slow down so you can make it to your assignment. And so God knows how to comfort us, ladies and gentlemen. He knows how to comfort us. We pray for Dr. Jean Bratton. We pray for all of you who have lost loved ones, all of you who have people hurting uh, in your family. And we pray for this nation, not only the nation, but the whole world. In the midst of this coronavirus, God has the answer, and God will bless ladies and gentlemen. So be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged. Praise God. Let the Lord bless you and, and keep you and guide you in Jesus' name. Well, all of that said, welcome once again to the Back to Basics Ministries Bible study, our Wednesday night study. 
we're going to close out tonight our four week special assignment special assignment CK down in Texas a special assignment on the subject how to be filled with the Holy Spirit um, this has been a very powerful and dynamic four weeks we're going to be powerful and dynamic tonight and then we'll take a couple weeks break and then we will start our new semester on Wednesday May 6 on Wednesday May 6 we will be studying from the Old Testament books of history part two you can take this course for free you can take it for fun or you can take this course for credit um, anyone wishing to take this next course starting on May 6 May 6 until July 22nd the course is free F R E E you can get three credits in our school of ministry and our school of ministry is fully accredited you can pick up three credits for those of you who are new uh, to back to basics ministries Bible study we have a school of ministry called the back to basics uh, school of ministry it is fully accredited ladies and gentlemen fully accredited and you can begin your studies and get your first uh, you can get your first three credits uh, by studying with us starting in May so hit me up uh, with a text message or a phone call or an email we we'll talk about this and we we'll, we we'll show you how you can get started in uh, school with us I had a, a message today one of my friends here in Georgia he wants to start the doctoral program um, we're going to start uh, doc, uh, brother Jacko Jacko Wayna Elijah's brother we're going to start him in the doctoral program in May so many people are benefiting from uh, the school as the school grows and we give God all the glory and the honor so once again we pray for Dr. Jean Bratton and the loss of her sister Julie and uh, we pray for this nation we pray for the nations of the world we want to welcome you ladies and gentlemen let's take a look at the scriptures and um, we're going to learn a lot tonight praise God praise God we're going to ask Karen Herzog from Fleetwood Pennsylvania to lead us in prayer if you will Karen I so well Father God thank you thank you for the ability to, to come again once once together um, on this Wednesday night in this additional um, study that Dr. Carter is is so willing to give us and and he is always filled with the Holy Spirit and we we thank you for that um, because his teachings are are definitely um, led Um, and we get so much from him and and this is extra so we are very grateful for that that you equip him with with all of this and we also ask um, to lift up Dr. Jean Bratton and her family for her loss that you can you can provide the comfort and the and the love and envelope them right now as as they're needing you, Father. Thank you so much for for giving them peace in their hearts. In the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. 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 Praise God. And uh, um, Karen, we thank you for the prayer. And as you go online later tonight at eight thirty, give our love to Dustina and all the brothers and sisters as you go online. Uh, and, and, and a special, a special presentation. Okay, praise God. I Let's will. Turn. I will. How did I know? I I just scanned Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that right before I came over. I'm like, I can't answer you. I got to go to class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'll be yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So you got a lot of classes on Wednesday. All right, praise God. Praise God. Okay, Karen is one of our outstanding students, ladies and gentlemen. She'll be she'll have her doctorate probably by this time next year. Very proud of you and the work you're doing, Karen. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, tonight. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Ladies and gentlemen, we want you to pay particular attention to these teachings tonight. I wish the whole body of Christ could be online with us tonight as we teach uh, part four of our subject, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If, if you have missed the previous teachings, you can go on my YouTube channel, YouTube forward slash Leroy Carter and look at the teachings, the three videos um, 
or contact me and I will send them to you. But we've had some powerful teachings. We're clear, clearing up a lot of things and, and, and making things right. So many people have been uh, taught improperly. So many abuses have taken place concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's so much ignorance in the body of Christ. But I praise God that the Holy Spirit is revealing Christ Jesus to us in these lessons as we glorify God and we're getting things straight. And you know, um, so many members of the body of Christ do not read the Bible. They don't. Read. They're so dependent on someone else to teach them, someone else. And if you have a teacher who's been misguided, if you have a teacher who's ignorant, you have a teacher who just ignores certain parts of Scripture, you have been cut off from the glory of God. And so we just praise God. And um, not that I'm the best teacher, but I know that I put a lot of work in this. But it's not me. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. And so we pray that you will uh, get on board and, and encourage others. And you know, I was thinking today, why can't members of the body of Christ um, recommend programs like this for other members of the body of Christ. For example, if you're a pastor and you don't have a Bible study, your church is shut down, you can't get out, and, 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 and the people need to study the Word of God, why don't you recommend that they tune in to this program? Dr. Jean Bratton does that. Dr. Jean Bratton had her, her, almost her whole church family on with us Sunday morning for the live Sunday morning service. And, and Dr. Jean Bratton is not selfish, and she's not afraid that somebody's going to steal their members. I can't steal your members. Uh, they're not mine. Hey, by the way, I don't even, I'm, between you and me, I don't even want your members. Uh, look, I've been a pastor. I, I know, hey, Karen Herzog, I've been a pastor. I know how church members are. They're with you one day. And the next day, you don't know where they stand. I don't even want your members, but I'll teach them. I'll train them in the Word of God. Amen. I'll train them in the Word of God. I hope nobody was offended by that, but I don't want people following me. I, you belong to Jesus. I will teach you what thus saith the Lord, but uh, no, no. I'm not claiming you as my member. You are not mine because I know how, how you folks are. You're with me one day. The next day, I'm a dog. Uh, then some of you go off. You leave the ministry for six months, and you talk about the pastor. You talk about me, and then you come back as though nothing happened. Some come back and are not apologetic. So no, 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 no. I'll teach them. You refer them to me. I will teach them with the love of Jesus Christ, but uh, I'm not going to claim them in membership. I don't even have a church to, to, uh, to call my own. I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Members of the church, members of the body of Christ belong to Jesus Christ. I've been called by the Lord to be a teacher, to be a pastor, a preacher. He's called me to be an apostle, and I praise God for that. Uh, we thank God. We have planted churches in other regions, areas of the world, uh, planted churches here in the U.S., but these churches do not belong to me. They belong to Jesus Christ. Okay, having said that, uh, Let's turn to the 12th chapter of Corinthians. We're going to go through Corinthians 11, Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians. Praise God. Um, we're going to ask um, we're going to ask Jackie if Jackie has her Bible open. Do you have your Bible open, hon? I do. Could um, you read? Could you read for us? Again? First Corinthians. Could you read for us, um, starting in First Corinthians? Read for us the first ten verses. First Corinthians, what chapter? Chapter twelve. Okay, the first ten verses. Spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, 
I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in men. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the works of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. And go one more verse, please. Verse the 12. body is a unit. Through it, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Thanks, Jackie Carter, for us, uh, my precious wife, y'all, for reading um, the scriptures concerning spiritual gifts. Paul says he does not want the church to be ignorant. He was writing to the church at, at Corinth. This was a rebellious church. It was a carnal-minded church. It was a church that all uh, the believers had come out of idolatry. Uh, many have come out of uh, 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 situations where they participate in sexual orgies and uh, this sort of thing happened. Uh, they worship idols. They worship uh, the, the Greek goddesses and gods. And, and, and so they came out of a pagan um, um, Gentile background. And, and so Paul is writing to them. These are believers now. They've been saved. But yet, as you look at 1 Corinthians you'll see they still practiced a lot of things that were not Christ-like. And Paul even reprimanded them uh, when it came to the Lord's Supper. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul rep rep reprimanded them about how they served the Lord's Supper. Uh, some, the, the well-to-do folks would, would eat a big meal and, and would not share their meal with the members of the body of Christ who were poor. Uh, and they even had their wine and their liquor at the at the services, and they drank their wine. They got drunk. They were gluttons. And Paul had to straighten a lot of things out. And even one of the leaders, main leaders of the church, was uh, shacking up with 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 his uh, uh, father's wife. Okay, which should have been his stepmom, but he was shack. I mean, he was sleeping with his stepmom. And so Paul rep reprimanded them on that. So we've, we learn a lot about the church in the world today, the modern-day church, by looking at Corinth. The, Cor the Corinthian church was corrupt. Yes, many were saved. They had given their hearts to Jesus. But just like you and I, when we get saved, we also need to be delivered. We get saved. That means we, we have a new relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But a lot of us come into Christ with burdens, with, with a lot of mess, with a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff we've learned from our mama, our grandmama, our daddy, our granddaddy, and the world. And we bring a lot of worldliness into the church assembly. A lot of people, people get saved, and they come into a church with demons living in them. You say, well, can demons live in Christians? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, you need to get a copy of my book, The Giants Are Back, and you'll learn how demons live in Christians. Well, I didn't know demons could live in Christians because when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, how can a demon live in you if you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, ladies and gentlemen, demons, demons uh, are not really concerned with your spirit. Demons want to control your mind. Demons are mind stealers. 
and as a man thinketh, so is he, the Bible says. Once a demon uh, moves in and gets control of your mind, a demon can live in your mind, and then from your mind, your spirit is corrupted, your body is corrupted, and many people die prematurely or are, or are eliminated because they do not know how to get rid of the demons. Well, what's a demon? Well, how does a demon react? Act. Well, a demon reacts like this. You know your, your, your girlfriend, uh, Josie, just got married, and she got this nice-looking husband, and, and, and they've only been married a short while, and you know he's flirtatious, and, 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 every, and you've been going over Josie's house more often since they got married because you're not really interested in Josie. You're flirting with her husband, and he's flirting back at you. That's demonic. That's demonic. It starts in you. You've got that demonic spirit in you. You're flirting. You're trying to hit on your girlfriend's husband. Likewise, uh, 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 Frank uh, might have uh, be, be flirting at you whenever Frank, Frank and Nancy come over to, to visit you. Frank is making eyes at you, and you're making eyes back at Frank. Before long, Frank calls you, hey, meet me, uh, so-and-so, and, and, and it's on. It's on. So, Christians do carry demonic spirits. Demons oppress us every day, 24-7. That is why Paul wrote uh, in another uh, book to the Ephesians, he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against ruler spirits, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Wherefore put ye on the whole armor of God that ye may stand and having done all. And so we need to come to reality. A lot of preachers don't preach about demonic spirits. A lot of them are, 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 are ignorant, and a lot of people don't want to deal with it because once you mention, mention it and start preaching it in your congregation, then you need to know how to get pe folks delivered. Some folks don't believe in having deliverance sessions, but there are deliverance sessions. And then uh, when you really get into it, and, and, and we teach this in the book, The Giants Are Back, if you can't get to a place or a person who can help get you delivered, you practice self-deliverance. You can cast out those demonic spirits out of your own life. If you know you're nasty, if you know you've got a bad attitude, if you know that you're greedy, if you know that you're lustful, if you know that uh, 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 you're a pastor, you're a man, and you like little boys, then you've got a demon in you, and you can cast out that demon by yourself with the power of the Holy Spirit. But a lot of people blink their eyes, and so the church moves on. The church goes on. The 21st century church is, 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 is corrupted by a lot of things that are not godlike. Why? Why is this? Because they have kicked Christ Jesus out of the church. They have kicked Christ Jesus out of their homes, even out of their minds. But we go through those motions of coming together on a regular basis and, uh, and, and doing what we call worship. So we've got a long way to go. And, and the, the key to the thing is to glorify Christ Jesus with our lives. We've got to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, uh, like Romans 12, uh, uh, 1 and 2 tells us to do. So we've got a long way to go. And I took off from something I said earlier. Why don't pastors recommend, if you're not teaching this, recommend that your congregation tune in to these s studies and, and get the teachings. This way we help glorify Jesus Christ. We help build up the body of Christ. There are so many pastors, so, so free, so many, they're, they're control freaks. They want to control what their people hear, my folks. He wants to control what his folks hear, and so his folks, for the duration of his pastorate or her pastorate, the people are ignorant. They learn ignorant stuff, they promote ignorant stuff, and they perpetuate it. And you know and I know that stuff we learn, our grandchildren will still be living in the same ignorance that we, we were ignorant because we were not enlightened or we blinked our eyes or we did not know the truth. But Paul says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, see, I'm back to where we ought to be. I would not have you ignorant. 
Paul is saying the church does not have to be ignorant. Somebody needs to say amen. The, amen. You do not have to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, you were pagans, you were corrupt, carried away with these dumb idols, even as you were led. And, and, and some of us are still being carried away by pagan practices, dumb stuff in the church that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ at all. And so, and so we're, we're, we're moving in this scripture to recognizing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine in which is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is a command from Jesus Christ to us through Paul as he wrote to the Ephesians in the book of Ephesians. Paul writes, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And now he's writing to the Corinthians, who were, uh, many were corrupted, and they called themselves Christians. Yes, they had received Christ, but they needed to be delivered. Paul even threatened them on one occasion. If you don't handle some of these issues, challenges that I'm talking about, that I'm writing about, I'm going to have to make a personal visit to you to Corinth. And Paul said, now I know you don't want that. You don't want me to come there personally. As, as Dr. Gene Bratton would say, no, you don't, you don't want me to open up this can of whoop. Because if Gene Bratton opens up a can of whoop, you're going to get whooped up on, okay? And so Paul said, no, you don't want me to open this. So take my advice, study my, le my lesson, read my letters, and, 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 and hear what the Lord is saying for you to do. Verse Verses 4 to 6, now there are diversities of gifts. And so, and, and Jackie read this for us, there are diversities of gifts. Ladies and gentlemen, God has, has all kinds of gifts for the, the, spirit, for the, the church of the living God. There are the gifts of administrations. Someone has to administer in the church. That's where church leadership comes in. Okay, church leaders are very important. Uh, t uh, Paul had to write to Timothy, young Timothy, who was a pastor in Crete, uh, about leader, developing leaders in the church and, and how to avoid certain leadership flaws that were going on in the church. He said, if a man desires the office of an elder, then he must be serious, meaning grave, serious. Uh, uh, not given too much wine, and, and, and the husband of one wife. And see, many of these men practice having more than one wife at the same time. No, if a man, a man of God must be the husband of one wife. And, and there's a whole list that uh, Paul gives Timothy in, 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 that, in that book, First Timothy. And so we need to study the whole scripture. And pastors, if you don't have a good Bible study, and 99% uh, of your people don't get the Bible, and, and, and please, please, Pastor, please, 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 let's blow this myth out of the window. When your people say, oh, I study my Bible at home, don't believe that. No, no, a thousand times no. They're not studying the Bible at home. They're reading a few scriptures. They might even be highlighting and red, yellow, and green markers, but they're not studying. They're not meditating the Word of God. They're reading a few verses, and then like most of us, after we read a few verses, we're asleep. Come on, somebody say amen out there. Say amen. A few verses. And we are asleep. We haven't studied diddly. Okay? So there are diversities of gifts. Gifts of administration, and that's to help operate the church, keep the church on a steady course, like having a captain on a ship. There are gifts of uh, operations. There are gifts of wisdom. Well, what's wisdom? Wisdom means that when, when you need to know what to do, like right now, the president, he doesn't know what to do. Dr. Burks, she doesn't know what to do. Uh, Dr. Fauci, they done kicked him to the curb. Uh, Mike Pence, he's just a mouthpiece. Uh, 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 
the governor, Governor Cuomo of New York, uh, 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 he's laying that stuff out there, but he doesn't have all the answers. And, and, and so many others, as we go down the line, the governor of Georgia, who says we're going to open up uh, uh, the community starting on Friday. Restaurants can open on Monday and this and that. And they're groping. They don't know what to do. And, and, and a lot of people need to be like uh, Noah. Noah built the ship, ladies and gentlemen, but nowhere in the book of, of, of uh, um, Genesis do we read where Noah told his family, okay, it's, it's safe to go out for a swim. No, they waited a year and a month and a half before they could even take the roof off the, off the, the boat. They stayed in the boat. They were confined. They practiced social uh, distancing. They were confined. They distanced themselves from the world. No, they didn't even go out swimming. They stayed in confinement. So we've got a, several governors. They want to rush people out there. And uh, uh, you watch. The governor's not going to go out to a restaurant on Monday. It's going to be one of y'all. So be, be, wise, be wise as a serpent and meek as a dove. And then there are other gifts. Wis wisdom, well, wisdom teaches us what should we do in this coronavirus. God's got the answer, ladies and gentlemen. What shall we do? God spoke to me last night in my prayer. He got me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And he said, now you preached uh, um, uh, two Sundays ago about a Holy Ghost breakthrough coming. He said, yes. And God spoke to me. He said, yes, a breakthrough is coming. The breakthrough is near. The breakthrough is near. You're going to see the breakthrough. Tell the body of Christ the breakthrough is near. And that's what God spoke to me. Okay? So, so we've got to seek God for wisdom. Well, God, what shall I do? What shall I do in light of this coronavirus? And, and the Lord will speak to me here, and he will tell you, wait on the Lord. Be still. Know that I'm God. The breakthrough's coming. Be still. Continue to contain yourself. Continue to practice what you're supposed to do. Uh, continue to wear your mask when you go out. But the breakthrough's coming. So uh, the, the Holy Ghost gives us wisdom. And then there are gifts of healings. Uh, the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge means uh, when we want to know what's going on. Lord, where did this coronavirus come from? And they're getting more and more insights daily that uh, this coronavirus started in a lab in a certain co country, in a laboratory in a certain country where none of the officials in that country have been impacted. In fact, hardly any people in some of the major cities in that country have been impacted. But it started in a certain uh, city that was like the guinea pig city. And then that laboratory-created virus, they say, was sent throughout the whole world, uh, specially packaged, and, 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 and especially for the United States and her allies. And so we're going to take a good look at that. But the word of knowledge, whether or not that's the true story, the word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit will reveal all things. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, and what the Scripture is saying to a lot of people who don't understand the Holy Spirit, you've got a lot of ignorant pastors out there, I don't want the Holy Ghost in my church because I, I don't want people talking in tongues in my church. Well, ladies and gentlemen, talking in tongues is not the Holy Spirit. Talking in tongues is, is a gift of the Holy Spirit, a gift. You've got about 11 more gifts. And so when you throw the Holy Spirit out the window, you're throwing your lifeline out the window. You're like on a ship on a stormy sea, and you've cut off the last lifeboat. You don't even have an inner, an inner tube. You don't have a hope because you've cut off your last lifeline. And many pastors in their ignorance, and, many, and I'm not just blaming pastors, many uh, believers in your ignorance, uh, many, many of you, many of you, and I welcome you to this ministry, and 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 welcome your friends. But a lot of people, we send out advertisements, we send out promotions, we send out the word, inviting people to come to Bible study. But a lot of them are not going to come because their pastors don't approve, 
And, you know, some of you pastors, you're so, bless God, ignorant. You're keeping people from the kingdom of God, and you're causing a lot of people to head down the, the road to hell uh, where you're going because, because you're cutting off somebody else. If you cut somebody else off deliberately from the grace of God, how, how can you say you're going to heaven? No way. No way. You're a reprobate, and you've got a corrupt mind, and you meet, need to be delivered. And if you can't deliver the word of God to the people of God whom God has, has entrusted you to teach, then you need to move over and let the Holy Ghost take over. If, if John Smith teaches and is in effective and is honest and trustworthy, why can't the members of your congregation uh, study under John Smith? It's, all, it's not about promoting your ministry or John Smith's ministry. It's about promoting the kingdom of God. Well, John Smith's going to uh, take away our tithes and, 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 and rob our church of the money. And see, that's your problem. Some of you are so blessed, God, concerned about money. Money is your God. Money is your idol. And so you need to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because the Corinthian church was idolatrous. Money, greed, sex. And so we're right on target. Somebody out there ought to say amen. Thank you. And so uh, when we get down to working of miracles, and, and, and you don't see many miracles happening in the body of, church, of Christ these days. Why? Because there's so much unbelief. So much unbelief. People don't want the Holy Ghost. And if you don't want the Holy Ghost, you're not going to see miracles. Uh, uh, prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Everybody wants to prophesy. Everybody wants to get, you know, you know, here's the thing. Everybody wants to get that mic in their hands. And I see more and more. And I, I praise God for the number of believers stepping up to the plate and, and, and sharing the word of God. And some are singing. And some are teaching the word of God. But it's dangerous when you get ignorant people with mics in their hands. And they have not studied the word, and they teach what's on their minds and, and, and teach this or teach what they heard Bishop so-and-so say. Listen, listen, Bishop so-and-so ought to be on this program studying the word of God so that he can teach his pastors and members of his denomination uh, the word of God. We teach the word of God, and we offer it for free to anybody who wants it. And so... Uh, don't let, I'm saying this, ladies and gentlemen, don't let anybody steal your crown. No, don't let anybody prevent you from drawing nigh to Christ. If you're a member of a certain congregation and you're not being fed the word of God, why can't you study here? Or why can't you study there? Or why can't you study with so-and-so? As long as you're getting the word of God, and if the motive of that teacher, prophet, Preacher, apostle, if the motives are pure, you ought to study under them. Why cut yourself off and die of starvation? And many believers are dying of spiritual starvation because they won't feed their spirits because their pastor will not permit them or their bishop will not, permission, will not permit them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to go to hell with your pastor? Huh, I'm, I, I said that. I asked that. It's out there. You're going to go to hell with your bishop? Some of these bishops who think they're so high and so mighty, there's, there's going to be a day of awakening for them, and they've got to give an account for how they treated the sheep of the living God. Now, I'm not condemning them. I'm just raising some questions. I've got to make sure I make it in. Come on, somebody say amen. Okay, so amen. it is the work of the Holy Spirit to bring spiritual gifts to God's people. And then I asked Jackie to stop at verse 12, and so I'm going to ask Jackie to read again. Amen. Uh, 12, Jackie, please read 12 through 23. Please. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, 
it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. Minister Loretta. It would not for that reason cease to be of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our present parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Praise God. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Paul so beautifully explains the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings to the church when we receive Christ and we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. By the way, you cannot receive the Holy Ghost until you receive Jesus. You must be born again. You can't join the church and, 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 and expect to get the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation, working miracles. No, you must. You can't join the church and get this. You must be born into the church by the Spirit of God. You must have a, an episode with God where you give your life, you surrender your life to the Lord, and you die. You've got to literally die so that you can be born again. Nothing is born again unless it dies first. Even a seed that you plant in the ground, and, and we're planting our spring garden this week, when you put seeds in the ground, those seeds have to die. The seed looks like has a certain appearance. It's going to shed off its outer shell, and then it's going to come up looking something different from the way you put it in the ground. And so, so it is with, with us. When we are born again, we have to die in order to be born again by the Spirit of God. And then when we die, ladies and gentlemen, please check this. We no longer own ourselves. We're no longer in control we are, are belong to Jesus Christ. And when the church realizes that, we can begin to grow. We can be, uh, let the Holy Spirit regenerate us and germinate us into what Christ wants us to be. And so Paul later writes to the Galatians in 2.20, For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when you're truly born again, you die to self, and then your life belongs to Jesus. And that is why it is so important to study the Word of God, to learn about this life in Christ. Uh, if, if you're not studying the Bible, if you're not getting any revelation of the Word of God, then you're not growing in Christ. That is why, once again, Paul admonishes people, stop being babes in, in Corinthians. Stop being babes. Grow up into the fullness of the body of Christ Jesus. Uh, uh, some people have been in church for 40, 50 years and are still chewing Blue John or eating pablum or, or, or still drinking milk when they ought to be chomping on the meat of the word. So we've got work to do and we've got the hunger and thirst after the Lord. And so, um, in what Jackie just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul equates the church, meaning not the building, but the members of the church. And the members are those who have been born again by the Spirit of God. Paul equates them to the human body. The church, Christianity, 
is members of one body who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, who have been born again by the Spirit of God. Everybody in church, in the church building, is not your brother and sister. I'm going to say that again. Everybody in the church building is not your brother and sister. There are many people sitting up in church who have not been born again by the Spirit of God. Well, what you talking about, Pastor Carter? Well, a lot of people have their name on the roll. Well, my mama founded the church. My daddy started the prayer band. Uh, my, my, my mama went around uh, with a wheelbarrow. Uh, as Sally Jones did in First Baptist Church of Pastown in Coatesville, picking up bricks to build a new building. Yes, we, we, we honor Sally Jones. We honor so many others. But there are many people who are in that fellowship but are not born again, have not been born into the fellowship. You must be born again. Ladies and gentlemen, come on now. You're 60 years old. You're 70 years old. You're still fighting against being born again. You think Jesus is going to let you into heaven because you went to church every Sunday? No, no, a thousand times no. Au contraire, as they say in French. Uh, no, you must be born again. Listen, Jesus is going to say to every one of us uh, who's been born again, uh, he's going to welcome us in the kingdom and tell us, tell us uh, 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 enter into my presence and the, to the joy of my kingdom, but he's going to say to a lot of people, depart from me. I never knew you, but God, but God, I went to church every Sunday. No, you never knew me. You never received me as your Savior and Lord. You got your name on the church roll. Yes, you put your dues card in the basket every Sunday with, with your little check or, or, or you clicked in your credit card and all that, but you never knew me. And so we have this marvelous opportunity to teach the Word of God, and then I'm training a lot of other pastors how to do this, how to do the online church, and many are stepping up to the plate. We've got a marvelous opportunity to help people to present the Word of God even in a time of, of national and state and local shutdowns and shut-ins, but we can present Christ Jesus so that the body is edified. That means so that the body is built up and so that Christ Jesus is glorified. And so when we look at the church, we're looking at the human body. I'm looking at my, my, on my arm. I've got, praise God, I, I've got five fingers on this my left arm, and I've got a wrist. And I got a forearm, and I got an elbow. I can bend my elbow. I got shoulders. Still got a bit, little bit of muscle in my triceps and my biceps. Okay. And so, so look, look, look. My my pointer, my pointer finger, my pointer finger can't say to my elbow, "I don't need you." And look, 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 look. If the pointer finger, you can't even point without an elbow. Okay. If you lose that muscle tone and all that, that flexibility, you can't point. Uh, if, if my eye says to my right foot, I don't need you, and try getting out of bed without turning the light on and, and, and get up and go to the bathroom and then come back. And how many of you have ever stomped your right big toe or your left big toe? Because you didn't have, come on, I know I, I know I can get an amen now. Come on, I Pastor Lisa Johnson. Okay. Amen. You stomped your toe, and you know, <laughs> and stomping your toe can hurt. hurt. And a lot of you know you're not, listen, 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 I ain't trying to get in your business, but a lot of, a lot of you know you ain't filled with the Holy Ghost. Because when you stomp your toe in the middle of the night in the dark, uh, those words that come out are not edifying or glorifying Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. And so the body, we need one another. I need you. You need me. When Gene Bratton hurts, I hurt. When Karen Herzog hurts, I hurt. When uh, 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 Pastor Gail hurts, I hurt. When Jackie Carter hurts, I hurt. When, when Ryan Truggle hurts, I hurt. We're part of the body. Because, because if my right wrist hurts, then my left knee hurts if my right hip okay let's talk about hips and knees because a lot of y'all know about hips and knees hips and knees 
or some some very sensitive things. If my right hip hurts, then my left knee gonna hurt. You watch. It, because if you're on a walking and the right hip hurts, then you're going to start trying to shift your dependence on your left side, and the and the and the and the your, your left heel is going to absorb the pounding when you when you when you put your foot down harder than you normally do. And you, guess what's going to suffer? Guess what's going to swell up and ache that left knee? And so we need every part. I need you. You need me. The bishop needs the janitor. The janitor needs the choir director. The choir director uh, needs the prophet. The prophet needs needs uh, uh, the administrator, and and we all need one another. And that is why when Ezekiel went to the valley of the dry bones in his, in Ezekiel chapter thirty thirty seven, and and the Holy Spirit took him over this valley, and all he saw was bones, parched bones, bleached white, and and uh, disorder and disarray, disorder. Uh, 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 toe bones over there with the skull bones, and the skull and the uh, finger bones over there with the knee bones, and the hip bones uh, hanging out with the with the uh, uh, neck bones, and and bones and, and out of place, and 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 the Holy Spirit. Ask Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? I mean, Ezekiel had a glimpse of the church, ladies and gentlemen, the body of Christ. It's a vision of the body of Christ. It was a vision of Israel, but it's also a vision of the body of Christ. We have our, our, our position. We have our calling. We have our things we're supposed to be doing. But we're not doing them. We're we're scattered. We're 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 not doing what the body of Christ can do. If the body of Christ today would rise up on one accord and say, Lord, end this coronavirus, we repent. If the body of Christ today, I'm talking about every believer, would say, Lord, we have sinned against you. We have violated Second Chronicles seven fourteen. But you said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin. And so if we did this, then we'd see what Ezekiel saw when the Holy Spirit said, prophesy unto these bones. Preach to the bones. The bones are out of place. The bones are not operating in the gifts that they, they, they have been given. The bones are not connected and in the place where I have placed them. And it's the same with the church. And when Ezekiel preached uh, to those bones, those bones came together. He preached to the wind first. The wind blew uh, the Spirit of God upon the bones. The bones, uh, the, the neck bone found the the shoulder bone and the shoulder bone found the back bone and the back bone found the hip bone and the hip bone found the thigh bone the thigh bone found the knee bone the knee bone found the, the calf and the calf found the ankle bone the ankle bone found the foot bone and the foot bone, foot bone found the, to, the, the uh, 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 toe bones and, and the body was put back together again and that's what we need in the church that is why um, we, we, we're teaching about how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the last three weeks, we've laid a groundwork for being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, God bless me to lay a good foundation for why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is, the relationship of the Holy Spirit with the body of Christ. And then last week, before the service was over, God had me pronounced to you, receive the Holy Spirit. And I say to you tonight, those of you who, are, uh, who missed last week, receive the Holy Spirit. And now all you have to do is just receive him just like you receive Jesus by faith when you got saved. When you receive Jesus, he came into your life. When you receive the Holy Spirit, he comes into your life. So receive the Holy Spirit. And then let these scriptures minister to you. Okay? And um, let the gifts be manifest where God chooses to place them. As we look more into chapter 14, 
when we look into chapter 14, you see the, the Holy Ghost places the gifts where he wants them. And then you may say, well, can I get the gift of tongues if I don't speak in tongues? Yes, you can. Do I need the gift of tongues? You don't necessarily need the gift of tongues. If, if you uh, speak in prophecy, the Bible teaches us that to prophesy is better than speaking in tongues. But God has his purpose for tongues. Tongues are to edify the believer. If When I speak in tongues, and yes, I do speak in tongues, uh, and I speak in tongues unto God. Speaking in tongues uh, is speaking unto God. I'm not speaking to y'all. I'm not speak I've used examples of speaking in tongues to give you an example in my teachings. But when I speak in tongues, I speak unto God. When I pray in tongues, I'm praying unto God. And so actually it's nobody else's business when I use my prayer language. And you may say, well, what's the difference between praying in tongues and what speaking in tongues? It's the difference between praying and speaking. When you're praying, you're praying unto God. When you're speaking, you're speaking either to God or speaking to an audience. And so we learn all these things through the through the teachings of the holy uh, holy scriptures. Praise God. Okay? Um, but then we're taught that uh, later on, you'll see in chapter 14, we do things decently and in order. There is no confusion in God. So there should be no confusion in the body of Christ. Or if there's confusion in your marriage, in your family, in your church, in the government, in the community, God did not start that confusion because the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. Confusion begins in the pit of hell. Satan is the author of confusion. And so we have to do all we can to get rid of the confusion. Husband and wife have to come on one accord. Families have to get together. Uh, somebody has to humble themselves or people have to humble themselves. And, and, and there are times we just have to just humble ourselves and just glorify God. Why? For the edification of of the marriage, for the edification of the family. Well, what's edify me? To build up the marriage, to build up the family, so that we all as a household will not cave in. We will not go under. We'll be like Noah's family on the boat. We'll stay on the boat until God says, take the roof off. And then when it's time to come out, we'll come out, and we'll come out stronger. We'll come out not uh, uh, four or five or six or seven or three, two or three people in confusion and fighting one another, but we come out on one accord. And ladies and gentlemen, when this coronavirus thing is lifted, every one of us and our families, every one of us and our brothers and sisters, we ought to come out of this on one accord stronger in Jesus Christ than ever before, and especially those of you who have been following these teachings on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, Pastor, does God want every person to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Yes, yes, yes. There's no way you can do the work of God without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> every, if you're not baptized with the Holy Spirit, that means it's your own effort. Oh, yes, some of you are doing good. You're feeding the hungry. Some of you are making masks out of cloth and, and materials, and you're sending them to people. That's good. That's good. That's good. And the world's doing that. A lot of worldly folks are making masks and, 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 and doing this. But when you do things on your own accord, on your own effort, it's not as great as when the Holy Spirit guides you and directs you. It's not as great a marriage when the Holy Spirit directs your marriage. It's not as great as when the Holy Spirit directs the, the church and God has placed certain gifts in the church prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers, uh, missionaries, and, and apostles, and all this. And so when we yield to the Holy Spirit, yes, yes, every believer ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you get that, Bishop? Did you get that, Pastor? Did you get that, Lone Ranger? Did you get that, uh, Control Freak? Every believer needs to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's where the power comes in. That's where the flow, the flow from heaven through the person to, to bring into existence what God wants. That's how it happens 
through the Holy Spirit. It is not us. It's not what we can do. It's not our ingenuity. It's not our creativity. It's the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote and said, it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Paul said, you know, I speak in tongues more than any of you, but you don't know it. He said, you'll never know it because speaking in, when I speak in tongues, I speak unto God and, 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 and not to men. And see, a lot of people, some of you need to be corrected. Uh, I know a couple pastor friends. I mean, they, they, they uh, preach, and part of their preaching is prophecy, part is in tongues, and there's no interpretation, and they're just, it's every Sunday, it's confusion. confusion. Then the thing is, pastors clone people. I mean, there's always somebody in the church who wants to be like the pastor. And so we pick up those habits, those little innuendos, the little freaky things that the pastors do, and we run with it and we start doing it. Then before long, you're in error, just like your pastor was in error. Why? Because your pastor didn't accept the whole logos, the whole word of God, the whole gospel. And, and, and he, did, he, or she, he or she did not accept the whole gospel or seek out the gospel or let the Holy Spirit teach them or correct them. And so, yes, the church is a mess. But God is going to correct things. He said there's a breakthrough coming. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a breakthrough coming, not just in America, but worldwide. There, yes, there's a dark cloud over the world right now. But ladies and gentlemen, there is a breakthrough coming, and it's coming soon. And God is going to get the glory and honor. You're going to see more miracles than you ever imagined. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to see folks who were walking in evil and hatred, walking in love. You're going to see the, uh, the script flipped in a whole lot of places. Praise God. How do I know? Because the Holy Spirit said it's going to happen. It's about to break forth. It's about to break forth. And so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to be in on this. I don't want to miss a thing. I w so I'm, I'm humbling myself, trying to humble myself repenting of my sins, drawing nigh to God, spending more time in the Word, spending more time uh, in, in, in prayer and, and developing a teachable spirit so that when the wave, we're talking about the wave, we're, we're talking about something greater than a tsunami wave, when the wave comes through, hallelujah, amen, praise God, uh, America will never be the same again. When the Holy Spirit breaks forth, uh, uh, your marriage will never be the same. Your household will never be the same. Uh, First Baptist will not be the same when you go back. And, and the Second Corinthians, Second uh, Presbyterian, Second Pentecostal will not be the same when people are allowed to go back to fellowship because God is going to do a new thing. And you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same again. Like Sister Janice, she's down in Texas now. But um, um, Pastor Lisa, when she was in Conshohocken, in Pennsylvania, she would say, I will never be the same again. I will never be the same again. Your choir used to sing that, Pastor Lisa. Yes. When Jesus comes in, new life will begin, and I'll never be the same again. Sister Janice said, there's been a great change in me. A great change in me. I am so happy. I am so free. He brought me out of darkness into the marvelous light. And I'll never be the same again. I can sing that all day long, ladies and gentlemen. Put my hands together, get on my feet, start dancing in the Spirit. Because <laughs> when we think about where the Holy Spirit has brought us from, and, and I remember how scared. I wasn't scared. I was scared before I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was just plain scared. But I'm so glad now that, that, that I pushed beyond that scaredness and being afraid. I pushed beyond all that dumb stuff people had taught me about the Holy Spirit. I pressed into the presence of God, and I said, Lord, here I am. Give it to me. Give it to me, Lord. Give it to me. Like Job, I was standing on the, on the brink. I'm saying, though you slay me, Yet will I trust you. Give me the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Fill me. And ladies and gentlemen, when the church stands before God and says, Lord, God, I can't stand anymore this madness. I can't even stand me. 
I can't stand this lying and this deception in this government. I can't stand this hypocrisy even in my home, in my marriage. I can't stand this thing in the church where there's so much uh, discrepancy and so much deceit. I need the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, when you hunger and thirst after righteousness and say, here I am, Holy Spirit, fill me, and I receive you by faith. When you reach that place, Heaven may open immediately. Heaven may open uh, later on. But heaven is going to come to you inside of you, and it's going to be contagious, and people are going to want what you've got. The bishop's going to want what you Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the bishop's going to call you up and say, hey, what's that? How do I get it? And then you've got to humble yourself and show the bishop. You've got to lead the bishop into receiving the Holy Spirit. I remember one time the Lord had me take a, a well-known pastor in our area uh, years ago and, and take him to the mountains to a retreat. I paid for the retreat. I drove him up there. I fixed his meals for him. I prayed for him and, 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 and ministered to him. And then the Lord had me minister, teach him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and that man's life has changed. He came back. His wife got changed. His church got changed. His, uh, some of the leaders of the church got changed. Yeah, well, well the church, many of them uh, resisted the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they kicked him out. They kicked him to the curb. But then he started another church. It was more powerful than what he was involved in. So God wants to change us. And ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about healing, when sickness tries to come upon your body, God does a Psalm 91 thing when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Psalm 91. Yes, there will be casualties on this journey, Dr. Gene Bratton. There will be casualties. Many of us will lose loved ones and friends. There will be casualties. We will see other Christians die uh, as casualties. But God is going to preserve the church, ladies and gentlemen. Satan cannot destroy the church, and God's will will be done. So, Say, come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Whew. I want to back up a little bit. Um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12 um, about calling Jesus accursed, anathema. And, you know, back in the first century, the Jews and the Roman world called Jesus Christ accursed, that he was anathema. And, and they even said that he had no right to exist on the earth. And they crucified him, and then they didn't want his name to be mentioned. They called him, they cursed Jesus, called him anathema. And, and, and they even say, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And, and the scriptures teach us that no believer, no person with the Holy Spirit will call Jesus Christ anathema, cursing him as though he should never have come to earth. And so... And that's 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, Pastor Lisa, would you read 1 Corinthians 13? And then I'll give a quick res response to that. Amen. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envious not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endures all things. Charity never fails. But whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. 
When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, and the, the thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see, see the, through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now, and now abides faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Praise God, praise God. And Pastor Lisa, what's another word for charity? Love. Love. Say it again, Pastor Lisa. Love. Love, y'all. Love, love, love. And when you read this, thir- this 13th chapter of uh, First Corinthians, we're talking about the love chapter, the charity uh, chapter. You can speak in tongues. You can influence people. You can prophesy. You can lay hands on the sick and cast out demons and, and all these things. But if it's not done with love, you're just a noisemaker. You're a noisemaker. There's a lot of ministries out there making noise. They're making noise, ladies and gentlemen, because the, the motive ain't right. Some of them are doing it for money. Some of them are doing it for self-aggrandizement. Some of them are doing it to be recognized among men. But when you do it out of love for Jesus Christ, to the glory and honor of God, oh, that makes Talking loud, the saying nothing. biggest difference. Yes, yes. I, I like this. I like and, and And Jackie reads with distinction, and, and, and Lisa reads with distinction, and Karen reads with distinction, and Jean reads with distinction. And so many of you, you enunciate every word and, and make it plain in your reading so that people hear the word of God. Don't stumble over those words. Don't hesitate over those words and make it plain so that people can hear, can hear. Uh, I was watching a, 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 a video of a, of a, a funeral service for a friend of mine up in Coatesville. It was on, on um, the Internet yesterday, and our hearts go out to this family. Um, but the pastor had one of those World War II gas masks on. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it was a sad, sir. His funerals are sad, but the pastor had one of those World War II gas masks on. And you couldn't hear, understand his words. And he wasn't enunciating well. So these are things we need to learn. Make it plain. Make it plain. If you've got a mask off, on, then, then you've got to speak through that mask so that people hear that word of God plainly. With no stuttering, no stammering, no uh, uh, missing syllables, and uh, no, uh, well, you know what I mean. Okay, but I like this this 12th verse. Now we see through a glass darkly. Okay, we don't, we don't, we don't understand all about the Holy Ghost. We don't understand much about the Holy Ghost baptism. We see the signs and wonders, we see miracles, we see things happening, and we give the glory and honor to God. We thank God for the Holy Spirit and glorify Him and worship Him. But, but the things we're seeing right now, we're seeing through a glass darkly. If you ever try to look through a glass, you can't see it all. But then, the Scripture says, but then the time is coming when we shall see it not in part but in full. And so you may be, you, okay, you're a member of the body of Christ, and you say, well, what's my gift? And, and God reveals, well, your gift is I want you to speak words of wisdom. Show people what to do in times of trouble. Or your gift is teaching. Or your gift is administration. Or your gift is uh, uh, you, be a good janitor. Keep the place clean. People need a clean place to, to fellowship in. And you may say, well, but I want to preach. I want that mic in my hand. I want that mic. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone not, is not supposed to have that microphone in the hand. If you've got a microphone in your hand and you've got a face mask on and you sound like you're coming out of a tunnel in World War II and nobody understands what you're saying, what good is, what good is it? Be what the Holy Spirit wants you to be. And then if God decides to add to your gifts or, or fine-tune you in this gift, then it's all, for, it's all for the edification. That's the word mean, building up of the church, of the family, of the body of Christ. Right now we see through a glass darkly. We can't even see. Some of us, we can't even see how our role and doing our role well is helping the body of Christ. 
Sometimes I wonder, is all this in vain? Am I helping anybody? And we all go through this, Karen. Am I really helping anybody? Is, is, is anybody out there? Have you ever had that experience? Is anybody out there? And, and, and there are times we feel like Elijah. I'm in a cave. I have self-distanced myself from all these crazy Jezebels and folks in the church don't, ain't right. Some of them don't want to get right. And, and I just don't want to be around them. I have self-distanced myself, and, and Lord, is all this, all this, what I've done, is, is it going to, does it amount to anything? We all go through those questions. So we look through a glass darkly, but then the day will come when the Holy Spirit will, Spirit will reveal Christ Jesus to all of us, and we will see that what we did for Christ did amount to something. It had its purpose. And, 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 and as we are faithful to what God has called us to do, every one of you will not speak in tongues. No, no. And some of you may ask for the gift of tongues, and you may not receive it. Some of you will not speak in prophecy. Every one of you will not lay hands on the sick, and they recover. But then let those who can do, and, and honor them, and, and, and encourage them, because, because it's like being a part of, of a team. I remember when I, I played baseball for so many years. I loved baseball. And uh, um, been in a lot of championship games. And uh, when, when one person was up to the plate to, to bat, we'd cheer for, hey, come on, man. Come on. Keep your eye on that ball. Keep, get your timing together. Relax. You can hit it. And, and even our coaches, coaches, they would encourage us. But I remember my coach in the championship game, in extra innings, we had gone 100 miles out of town to play this undefeated team. And the boy pitching had never lost a game in all of his high school career. And in the top of the 11th inning, my coach said to me, and I was a leadoff batter that inning, he said, Leroy, come here. He said, I coach your father. Your father's a good ball player. You're a good ball player. He said, I'm going to tell you this. He said, you're scared of that boy's curveball. And you, you swing on that curveball and hit that ball. Because if you don't, you're going to walk home. And he's talking about 100 miles. Well, and I thought he was serious. So I got up and I hit a triple. <laughs> I hit a triple. First went, first lead, first uh, one to the... Uh, at, up to the plate. Then later on, somebody hit a ball to the outfield, so I tagged on third base and made it safely home. And then we kept the other team from scoring, and we won a great game, ladies and gentlemen. And everybody cheered as though everybody hit that triple, as though everybody hit that pop fly that brought in that run. See, that's teamwork. That's, that's the way the church ought to be. Everybody celebrates the victory. Everybody helps one another. That's what we ought to be doing in the church. Okay, chapter 14. Chapter 14 is a long chapter, and I can't go into it all, but it talks about the ways in which people do not obey God with the gifts of the Spirit and how we dishonor God with the gifts of the Spirit. And so what Paul does with uh, chapter 14 he starts, starts off with saying, follow after charity, follow after love, Pastor Lisa, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you prophesy. So many people want to speak in tongues. So many people are scared of tongues. But Paul said, no, no, desire spiritual gifts, but of all the gifts, desire prophecy. Desire prophecy rather than tongues. Tongues has caused confusion. You can be speaking in tongues and someone comes into the uh, church or the assembly or, or the building, and they hear you, and they don't have a clue what you're saying. And oftentimes, you don't have a clue what you're saying. And so it causes confusion. And so they leave and say, hey, they're crazy over there. And yes, they are crazy because they're out of order. And so Paul said, those who speak in tongues ought to operate in it accordingly and read chapter 14 to learn how to speak in tongues or how to use your new prayer language or how to uh, speak to God 
in an unknown language. But then Paul says, it's better to desire to prophesy. In other words, prophesy means to speak in your language, your own language. Speak to people in your own language. Speak to God in your own language. Speak for edification and speak for clarification and speak to build people up. In other words, if a stranger comes into your assembly and someone is prophesying and two or three prophets are prophesying, then they're speaking in the natural language that the stranger comes in understands. And there is no problem. But if a stranger comes in and 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 uh, one speaking in one tongue and one speaking in another tongue and another tongue and there's no interpreter in the congregation, then you get you you bad mouth Jesus. You put a bad mark on Jesus Christ. And we've all been involved in those services where people uh, uh, embarrass Christ. Why? Because because. The scripture teaches us, and we get this also in 1 Corinthians 14, the prophet controls the gift. What's that mean? It means if God gives me the gift of tongues, I have the control over the tongue. I just don't blurt out stuff because I feel like speaking in tongues. I don't blurt out stuff. I control. I know when to speak in tongues and when not to. And if I don't have an interpretation, I'm not to speak in tongues. If there's no interpreter, the tongues ought to be under the control of the prophet. The same with the prophecy. In, in many of our churches, everybody wants to be a prophet. Everybody wants to prophesy. Everybody wants to be like Pastor so-and-so. They want to be a prophet. They want to get their own radio show, get their own TV show, get their own online ministry. And, 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 and here's what I see a lot of people doing, especially in this nation. They see somebody, a certain person, he's got a prophetic ministry. And so, and, and what he does, he takes current events and then he relates current events to things happening in, in, in the world or in the local community. And so everybody wants to be like them. None of them study the scripture. Not a single one is really studying the scripture and coming under the authority of the scripture. And Lord knows, do they have the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Many do not come under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. No knowledge, no word of knowledge, no word of wisdom, but they got their own shows now, and they send out their emails, uh, 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 my online service, uh, join me certain time of the week, and, and uh, now they call it a watch party. I've got my own watch party, and, and, so, and so they try to duplicate and imitate what they see Pastor So-and-so doing. It's pitiful. It's pathetic in this nation, ladies and gentlemen, not only in this nation, but what happens in the American church is duplicated worldwide. And so we need to all pull ourselves in and come under the authority of the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit direct us. And listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. When you read chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> be willing to humble yourself before God. Be willing to be corrected. Don't be stubborn. Don't be proud. Don't let the proud spirit uh, mess you up because there are so many people in the body of Christ. You can't teach them diddly. You can't. They know it all, and they don't want to hear correction. And, and, and so they go. They run with it for a while, and many will fall on their face. And then when they fall on their face, they want everybody to have mercy, have pity on them. And, this, and, and then so, so you spend time praying for them, uh, pumping them back up, trying to edify them, trying to build them back up. And, and because they do not want to humble themselves and won't get rid of that spirit of pride, they go back and do the same thing again. And, and so Paul says, some of you need to grow up into the fullness of the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, grow up into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. You need to stop pulling the body down because you refuse to grow up. Study the word of God. Some of you ought to be teachers. Why do you have to be taught 30, 40 years? Some of you are ready now to do your own teaching. Some of you are ready to do your own teaching. 
a call from Jamaica. I can't take it right now. Okay? Some of you are ready to be your own teachers. So let the Holy Spirit guide you and lead you. And then I want to just end with this. <clears throat> um, some contrast, some things that I picked up in, in, in uh, the commentary that I use in my Dakes Bible. If you ever want to get a Bible that has a commentary and, and, and a, a real good breakdown of almost every, pa every passage of Scripture, Dakes, the Dakes Bible, one of the best gifts I ever had. I got this from the Benny Hinn ministry about 10 years ago. And the Dakes Bible, Dakes lived in La nearby Lawrenceville, Georgia, about 20 miles from here. And <clears throat> these are some things that he wrote as he summarized the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Let me share these with you. Number one, tongues are spoken to God. Prophecy is spoken to teach men. Okay, so that's the difference. Tongues are spoken unto God, prophecy unto men. Mysteries or things not understood are spoken in tongues. All things spoken in prophecy are clear. That's verses 3 to 4, 1 Corinthians 14. Tongues edify the speaker. Prophecy edifies the speaker and others, verses 3 and 4. Tongues enable one to commune with God. Prophecy speaks to men to edification, exhortation, and comfort, verses 2 to 4. The prophet is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless the tongues are interpreted and understood. Verse 5. So the church has got this thing all messed up. Oh, man, she speaks in tongues. She's spiritual. The prophet is greater than the tongue talker in God's sight, ladies and gentlemen. Number six, tongues are no profit to the public unless interpreted. All prophecy is profitable to the public. Number seven, the speaker in tongues must pray for the interpretation. The prophet need not, for his message is in his own tongue. Number eight, tongues make one a barbarian to others. Prophecy does not. Number nine, in all gifts, the main purpose is to excel in edifying the church. In this, prophecy is greater than tongues. Ten, the human spirit of the speaker is the thing edified by tongues. Prophecy benefits all men. See how prophecy is greater than tongues? Number eleven, tongues are a great personal blessing. But five words of prophecy are more important in public services than 10,000 words in tongues. Verses 17 through 19. Number 12, tongues are a sign to unbelievers, prophecy to believers, verses 21 and 22. Number 13, all speaking in tongues at once causes mockery by the unsaved, whereas with prophesying, the unsaved are convicted of sin. Number 14, every gift must be used to edify the church. Prophecies do this better. Number 15, only one message is allowed in a church service if not interpreted. Three messages in prophecy are allowed. Number 16, three messages in tongues are allowed in any church service if they are interpreted. So if you've got a church service, several people speaking in tongues, they are all out of order. If you've got a church service and you got three or four people uh, speaking in prophecy, they're out of order. So 1 Corinthians 14 teaches us how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, and it especially clarifies between tongues and how we're to operate in tongues and prophecy and how we're to operate in prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14 does not go much into laying hands on the sick, 
on the sick and performing miracles in the name of Jesus and casting out demons. But you get much of this in other parts of the New Testament. And so as we grow and as we change from being bleached, white, lifeless bones on a beach or in a valley, as we transform from those, bone, those lifeless bones that are not connected, have no life in them, the body of Christ can be built up by the Holy Spirit through love and faith into a mighty, exceeding, great army to the glory and honor of God. That's what we shall be. That's what the Lord said we're going to be. No tsunami, no coronavirus, no mass murder, no violence, no war. What shall separate us from the love of God? Not even death will be able to hold back the Holy Spirit from making the church what Christ intended us to be. So I say be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we taught over the last three weeks, each of these weeks, we've mentioned that be filled is from the aorist tense, A-O-R-I-S-T, from the Greek aorist tense, which means continue to be filled. Continue to be filled. You got filled with the Holy Ghost in 1963, and you're still trying to operate on that 1963 filling. Can't do it. Can't do it. Uh, you're still operating on... Oh, the last time you went to Red Lobster, now that you can't go to Red Lobster, you're still enjoying, you still, you taste bud still smacking over the flavor of that lobster, or you still, uh, 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 um, you, you're still glorying in the last time you went to uh, 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 Smoky Bones or uh, 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 up in Pennsylvania, Shady Maple. You're still savoring the food you tasted shady maple five years ago? No, 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 you're not. you got to constantly be filled. Uh, when's the last time you ate a good meal? When's the last time you ate? June 16th, 1975? Uh, that was a good meal? No, you got to eat every day. And because you have to eat every day, you got to be nourished every day, be nurtured by the Holy Spirit every day, because the Scripture says, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's continuous action. Be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. Never think that you have arrived because you got something. Keep getting filled. The scripture says keep being filled. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And give God the glory. And the scripture says it does not yet appear what we shall be. Father God, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. We honor you. Thank you, Father, for this series on uh, the Holy Spirit baptism. And thank you for CK down in Texas for uh, um, suggesting this series. And, and the many people who uh, backed her up and said, yes, we want teachings. And thank you that you've given us the teachings through your scripture. Help us to seek your word because we've only touched on part, parts of what your word says, we're, we're looking through a glass darkly, but then we shall see face to face. We shall see the whole picture as we open our hearts to receive from you. We praise you. We bless you. We thank you. And in Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. I invite you to join me on Sunday morning, uh, those of you who can, the same hookup, same connection, where God is sending powerful messages, powerful messages, ladies and gentlemen, to bless the body of Christ, especially in these evil and dark days, people are being set free. And so we invite you to join us and uh, tell of other people and, and those pastors who may not be able to host online services, tell them, uh, we don't, you don't have to leave the people in the dark. Why don't you join the Back to Basics Ministries on Sunday morning or Wednesday nights? And then when the when the, the dark clouds are gone or pass by, uh, 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 then we release you to your, your fellowships and, and, and you will have grown and we will have grown and the love of Christ will abound and God Amen. will be glorified 
Amen. We're going to stop our recording at this time. And we're...